Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 13th session of uh, today's conference uh, titled Global Law School Summit. Uh, the theme of our session number 13 is the new law of the global, the globalization of international law. Today, we have four distinguished speakers, participants in this panel. We have Professor Vesna Srinich Grotic uh, from University uh, of uh, Regica, Croatia. We have Professor Sadi Siachi from uh, Turkey. We have Professor Matthias Kam from New York. And we have Professor Austin Parrish from uh, Indiana Bloomington. As, as said before, the theme of our conversation here in this panel is a new law of the global. Globalization has been uh, debated for some time now. Uh, but the question always hangs around is whether what is the global? Going by the various UN indices, globalization, while remains a buzzword, effects of globalization have ebbed and flowed. Global in the end means a tiny part of the globe that is rich in capital and ready to export, export its laws for the protection of that capital. The export of the capital is followed by the rules of its protection. In that sense, capitalism has been able to cut through the sovereignty of many states. So while the European Union is experimenting with a shared sovereignty, as we know, for the last 50, 60 years, some fallouts are seen in Hungary's and Poland's authoritarian turn. The globe is generally deglobalizing, we can say, and that there is some kind of a stretched liberalism that has not, is not working. Law and development as a subject um, has looked at these issues of how globalization and law interact uh, in the world. So where does, where does this leave us lawyers with the law of the new global? Do we expect more protectionism? China has just beaten the US to become the world's richest nation. Will the globalization of the law have the same meaning to it since the world's richest nation is not a Western nation anymore? Uh, shall we see a new, uh, new, new international economic order, NIEO? Uh, these are some of the questions, uh, observations uh, uh, um, that, 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 uh, that we start our discussions with. Um, so I would like to start the discussions by inviting Professor Vesna Srinish Grotic uh, to give her first set of uh, observations. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Prabhakar, and uh, thank you also the organizer for, for inviting me to this uh, impressive, uh, impressive conference with uh, such a huge number of panels. Uh, I am honored to be uh, participating in, in one. Uh, globalization, of course, can mean many words. As you said, it can be a buzzword, but I also think it has become a bad word over time because uh, well, the pandemic that we are facing is also one of the consequences of globalization. Before the doctors in South Africa discovered that there's a new variant already, people were all over the world. I mean, only in one country we had dozens of cases of uh, this new uh, letter of, of Greek uh, alphabet that not everybody is sure how to pronounce. So is it Omicron or is it Omicron perhaps? <laughs> Uh, my uh, vision of, of globalization uh, in connection with international law is both positive and negative uh, in terms of uh, that it affected the spread of, of international law to, to areas which are very important in my view. Uh, capital, as you said, may be one such field, but I would rather concentrate on the field of the protection of human rights I think that the globalization has uh, contributed to the, the, the raise of the standard, uh, international standard of the protection of, of human rights. I also think that uh, international environmental law has uh, uh, somehow, I wouldn't say benefited, but at least it came to the front uh, because uh, of, uh, of globalization. And I would also, uh, shed more light on, on international criminal law. Uh, just uh, two days ago, there was a court case in Germany where uh, a member of uh, uh, Islamic State, ISIS, was convicted for genocide based on the universal jurisdiction, which is, I think, uh, uh, a new step for the universal jurisdiction because we had that before. 
but this is a, perhaps a new beginning for the universal uh, jurisdiction and perhaps a new beginning for uh, uh, condemning and convicting people for committing such uh, uh, terrible criminal acts such as genocide or uh, crimes against humanity. So that's my positive view of, of, uh, of globalization, but of course there are also many negative that perhaps we can discuss later on. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vesna. Uh, I would like now. I would now like uh, to invite Professor uh, Sadi, uh, who is uh, dean at Baskent University, Turkey, to give his preliminary remarks. Well, uh, I am a retired military lawyer, so I would prefer to follow with the guidelines provided by yourself to me, asking the first question as, "What is the new law of the global?" Uh, I, I like to talk about uh, that uh, point of uh, the issue. Well, the point of departure could be this concept that we are living through an interesting period of time, a transformation of all concepts, all issues, all challenges, sometimes repeating the old ones. As lawyers, we are facing also a dichotomy in this regard. On one hand, we preach the importance of rule of law, but on the other hand, when we carefully observe and follow the press and media reports, what we witness is that widespread application or practices of influence or destabilization, destabilization operations based on major powers, policy preferences and practices. What we also see is growing tendency in international community for self-help practices. They are not uh, intending to have a peaceful settlement, uh, a final settlement to ongoing uh, disputes that might be present among the nations. They are leaving that kind of settlement to the long-term efforts, but they are relying more and more on factual or de facto situations. Uh, I think the French word fait accompli is a uh, most favorite uh, terminology in this regard. Uh, we are, we are, we are uh, living through and going through unbelievable incidents taking place in many developed countries as well as developing countries. Abuse or exploitation of value-based democratic culture and order uh, by using secret methodology, clandestine intelligence operations to include cyber operations or sometimes more sophisticated cases of proxy war strategy as a foreign policy tool. All these are at present time challenges for us international lawyers. But this is not, of course, an excuse for national governments. What I mean is the, 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 the efforts of the external powers, as they are call, called in domestic politics. Many times, the blame of many mishappenings within the country are put on the, these ex, so-called external forces. I do not agree with this kind of uh, attitude, peace and security in every aspect is a national responsibility. And uh, if that is the case, as they claim, then probably the national government is missing something or doing something wrong. So this is my uh, preliminary remarks about the overall subject. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sadi. Uh, uh, your reference to uh, the clandestine uh, operations and clandestines, uh, a clandestine way of running the world or international relations reminded me of how as soon, as, soon after the Russian Revolution, one of the things Lenin did was to, the, the first government did was to actually expose the, uh, the, 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 uh, the secret treaties uh, of the Tsar. Uh, and, and somehow it happened. It, 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 somehow America seems to have inherited that practice, despite uh, you know, uh, despite uh, ideological differences between the American system and the Russian system, uh, in a post-revolutionary Russian system. Very interesting. Thank you. Let me now turn to Professor Matthias Kamm, 
Um, and uh, 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 and my question to him is that although we, we have titled our session as globalization of international law, international law is not globalizing for the first time. The first globalization or the classic globalization of international law for us public international lawyers is what we know as the universalization of international law. So, uh, so, so, so uh, I welcome Professor Matthias come for his uh, preliminary remarks. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, you are absolutely right uh, to point out that when we are talking about globalization, we are not talking about a new phenomenon for international law. And we can, we can, if we look at the history of international law, and we draw in very simple, large lines, I think it's possible to say um, that the the phenomenon that has been since the mid 90s, at least, have been described as globalization um, uh, um, and related to international law is the third wave uh, of globalization. The first wave was the 19th century wave, where um, international law still very much really only the public law of Europe, a jus publicum Europeum, where it was effectively the law um, by which um, now the whole globe um, would be structured um, in a way that allows for uh, competitive imperial enterprises by major European metropolitan centers. Um, so that's one way to think about, uh, it's a reductive way, but nonetheless uh, a, a way that captures central elements of what international law throughout the 19th century might be thought of being about. But this was still a time of globalization. It was European globalization. Uh, it was a project of European-based uh, empire for the most part, but it was globalization nonetheless in the sense that for the first time, um, there was such a thing as, an, as a legal infrastructure that genuinely claimed to apply everywhere in the world. Uh, it structured the whole globe and led to the universalization of grids of space and time. Um, so um, uh, the longitude, latitude, the description of each space in the world, the first putting everything on the map and then, then assigning a distinctive space on a universal map uh, and then creating time zones, which allows us to have these types of meetings, for example, and knowing exactly at what point in time, uh, what Eastern, what India standard time means anywhere in the world. You know, all of these things are 19th century um, uh, effects of 19th century uh, globalization um, uh, and, in which international law played a very important role. The 20th century version uh, comes with a universalization of the underlying norms themselves. So this is about um, now the first wave of de-Europeanization de of international law. Now the idea of statehood becomes genuinely universal states as a framework of self-government for the people that are to be governed within the state, decolonization, self-determination, uh, human rights. Um, all of these norms um, are uh, norms that are deeply connected with the project uh, of uh, universalization uh, of international law. But at that point still, for much of the 20th century, notwithstanding the universalization of the norms um, uh, and the um, we still have a an political and institutional anchoring of uh, these ideas in the West. Uh, so this is still very much the political imagination, the legal imagination, the core actors, uh, notwithstanding the genuine universalization of the underlying basic normative principles uh, remain uh, Western focused, not Europe focused. Europe at that point recedes uh, and in, in many ways becomes a second um, is, is no longer the dominant actor the United States is. Um, uh, but nonetheless, it's a, it's, it's a, since the 20th century, we talk about the West. Nobody talked about the West in the 19th century, or at least not in the same way. They talked about Europe. Um, uh, and so we move from Europe to the, to the West as a different kind of power anchoring of international law. And in the last period where we, in which, which we are seeing now, or we see the end of now uh, of globalization is a period uh, a further decentering. Uh, so it's no, the West is no longer, it still plays a dominant role in certain areas, certainly in the uh, economic structures, but it's losing its grip. And many of the anxieties that we see 
uh, are just anxieties connected to genuine and deep pluralization um, of international law with the greater varieties uh, of centers of powers, genuine pluralism. Um, note how uh, some of the major projects and reforms in international law after 1990, think about the creation of the International Criminal Court, uh, was a project which was not led and to some extent even fought by uh, the United States, which was the source of basically all major institutions and projects directly after 1945. So after 1945, the second wave of globalization was an American-led project. Uh, and after 1990, even though the United States, of course, in the field of, of economic globalization has still played a leadership role, uh, in other areas uh, played a very different um, uh, retarding and even, even subversive um, role. Um, so it's a very different world. Um, uh, the, the last wave of globalization, the current wave of globalization is one, and this is a claim that, that um, perhaps um, will resonate in India somewhat more critically than it would elsewhere, where I would claim that the old the talk of the global north, the global south, unless we understand that as metaphors uh, for centers of privilege and power um, um, of, of some kind of center versus a periphery, but that is no longer really linked to geography in a straightforward and simple way. Uh, so unless we understand it merely metaphorically, that time is really over. Um, the reality today is not one which is adequ adequately captured uh, in those types of categories. And even if you're critical, say, uh, of capitalism and the role of capital um, and, and the legal structures being ones that enable and privilege capital, if that's your analysis, then you'd have to come to the conclusion that what used to be a straightforward structure which privileges capital exporting companies, uh, exporting countries vis-a-vis -vis capital importing ones, these distinctions are no longer as clean cut most countries are no longer simply importers of capital or exporters of capital, um, but you have much more of a much more uh, the formal uh, the formal structure which always used to be in the 20th century based on reciprocity was always that if Germany and Pakistan entered into a, 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 fr a free trade agreement formally it would be based on reciprocity it's no longer an imposition. Uh, in a straightforward, formal way of one state over another in a colonial way. But nonetheless, it was exporters versus importers of capital. That, of course, today is much more complicated. And if you look at the adjudication and, and the role of um, arbitration in this area, very often the defendants, the states who are subject in these proceedings, are, are, are European states, can even be the United States, uh, and it's no longer exclusively. So capital is protected today also against democratic majorities uh, in um, the OECD world, in the global north. So this is, so th there's a big shift in the structure of globalization uh, in the, towards the end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century in the third wave, if you want to call it that. Thank you, Professor Matthias Kuhn for your uh, uh, first uh, set of remarks. If I understand you correctly, you, you spoke about uh, uh, how uh, ideas of self-determination, birth of the UN, et cetera, et cetera, was the first set of globalization soon after, uh, which came with decolonization, uh, you know? That's the and second, yes, the second the wave. Second wave of uh, globalization, which came with the birth, around the birth of the UN. Uh, yes. Since you spoke about self-determination, self-determination, is an important concept for uh, developing countries that began to decolonize uh, from the middle of 1940s. India became free in 1947, Philippines in 46, China in 49, and roughly a decade after Asia decolonized, Africa began to, began to decolonize. Um, with, that, I, with that observation, I turn to Professor Austin Parrish, um, uh, make, also making the observation that the idea of self-determination was of Wilsonian origin and American origin. And in the first decade of Indian independence, although because we are a product of British uh, colonialism, naturally our laws, we are a common law system because of British um, common law uh, uh, background. One of the arguments that lawyers before the Indian Supreme Court were making that let's, uh, let's accept the common law of America, which is more liberating um, as compared to the common law of England. Uh, it was tautological, I suppose, but the spirit behind this was that since we're broken off from, um, uh, from 
the, the claim in the early decade of Indian decolonization was that just as America broke off 200 years ago from British Empire, we are breaking off and decolonizing from England. So some parallels India was trying to, uh, Indian lawyers were trying to, Indian constitutional lawyers were trying to draw parallels between American, uh, uh, you know, breaking off and the Indian breaking off, uh, of course, but it was more tautological than substantive. Uh, nevertheless, the idea of self-determination was of Wilsonian origin. So with that, I turn to Professor Austin Parrish for his first set of remarks. Thank you. Great. Well, well, thank you. And, and, and like others, let me thank the organizers. Another wonderful conference uh, hosted by Jindal. Um, you know, maybe I can tie together a few themes that have already been discussed. Um, you know, Professor Kum, I think, was talking about the globalization of law and the different waves of globalization of law that was governing uh, the global world. Some of the earlier comments focused on the fact of globalization, uh, the, uh, the increase in capital, the, the flows and travel, which leads to particular problems. And I, I think um, whether that's human rights, environmental rights, cybersecurity, national security, those issues have become, or at least feel more, more prominent. Uh, uh, Pre Professor Rotten started off with talking about uh, COVID-19 and, and the facts of globalization as a descriptive factor, not of law, but of what is occurring in the world, has meant that the role for law and the role of international law and globalized law has become uh, more prominent in many ways. I think the second part of the globalization in the third wave, uh, using Professor Kuhn's terminology, is that we're seeing some of the same things happening with law that we see that's happening with globalization uh, generally. So if globalization is one of increased competition and contestation, we're seeing the same thing with law itself. That, that may be occurring between um, uh, post-colonial uh, approaches, uh, perhaps what Professor Kuhn was referring to as the North-South uh, divide, uh, that's also occurring in the way that uh, Professor Saadi was describing between uh, different hegemonic powers, whether that's the United States and in China, as they're both sort of influencing and trying to change the law international law in a particular way. It's also happening with different visions of international law, whether that's globalism versus globalization, the theory of whether international law should be primarily focused on the human or whether it should continue to remain uh, anchored to a state-based uh, theory. But it's also occurring between the projection of domestic law versus more traditional international law. And so uh, part of the description of pluralism is not just that there's lots of different things happening, but rather that we're seeing contestation within law itself as to which will sort of capture the hearts and minds to be sort of the next model, whether that's the fourth wave or something else is, is hard to say. And so, but I actually think that description of what's happening in the legal realm, comp contestation, pluralism, uh, the, these challenging for, you know, is China going to be able to mold uh, the international law regime a little more to its view? Will the United States continue to play a broad role in the projection of norms? What will be the role of post-colonial uh, uh, developing nations in the creation of new norms? That's actually very consistent with what we're seeing in globalization as a descriptive term for what's happening with the world uh, with increased uh, complexity and increased capital flows and, and cybersecurity concerns. And so perhaps Perhaps the new law of the global isn't particularly new at all. It's just a different form and a continuation of things that we've been seeing over a long period of time. It's just that at least in the moment, it feels more pressing and more chaotic uh, as we see these new forms coming in and, and lots of questions as to how individual states or individual actors or non-government entities and others, what role they'll play um, and how much force they'll be able to use to project or create the law in the way and the vision they particularly see. I'll stop there, I, um, but uh, happy, happy to go into more detail. Thank you, Professor Parrish, for um, your first set of remarks. Of course, um, as, as has been uh, voiced in, uh, in various degrees by all our speakers today, uh, there is some expectation of sociology upon us international lawyers. We are not trained as sociologists. Um, some of us are maybe, but largely when we speak about globalization, um, sociology is one discipline that very robustly studies it um, in terms of actors and you know uh, factors, actors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When we speak about globalization of international law, and when, as Professor Matthias come try to problematize it or may, by uh, saying that some of the issues we see in Europe today uh, or in the in the global north today has to do with the anxieties related to rising pluralism. Uh, so perhaps 
the first set of globalization in the 19th century was not so much about pluralism, uh, if I may sort of kind of, kind of uh, you know, uh, present uh, 19th century in that way. And I often think that uh, if we call 19th century the first century of proper globalization because of the scale of movement of people and you know persons uh, and, 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 and capital from one part of the world to the other part of the world, it appears that that globalization was about putting Europeans everywhere, but you know, uh, not everyone in Europe, right? And therefore you have this one-sided globalization. Uh, China's rhetoric uh, uh, in terms of, China is rising, of course. Uh, China's rise has nothing to do with democracy. It has its own way of rise by controlling the market, by keeping its borders sealed from influences, political, cultural influences. So naturally China's success, if we accept China's success, uh, naturally we also have to debate how was China successful as compared to uh, liberal democracy that are now struggling with some of the, you know, spaces and places that were liberal are now kind of shrinking uh, for whatever kind of backlash. That is what we call reverse, uh, some kind of reversal in globalization. So, uh, Professor uh, uh, Professor Vesna was more sort of optimistic uh, with the idea of globalization, where she said that despite problems that it might have, one thing that she was able to see was that there were a lot of uh, rights development and certain communities that would not have otherwise got rights, or uh, uh, you know, certain communities that have, that were historically marginalized were able to benefit from the vocabulary of human rights that is the product of globalization. So naturally, depending upon who we are, investment lawyers or human rights lawyers or constitutional lawyers, we naturally see the same globalization of international law in various ways. We always you know, kind of uh, take that globalization and chop it and uh, into, uh, with our uh, disciplinary limitations. And then perhaps we theorize it or speak about it. So, uh, going back to Professor Vesna, um, uh, 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 how, how do you see, how do you compare um, the development of rights for marginalized communities vis-a-vis -vis the rise of non-democratic, non-European countries uh, to power and reversing some of those right discourses? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you have a very, very, very complex questions, if, if I may say so. Uh, as I said, I, I uh, pointed out what uh, what was positive about globalization from from where I uh, stand, but also, as I said, there are also negative points. And of course, in a positive way, uh, there was a, a reaction finally, and the reaction from many a number of states actually was to oppose these positive sides of of globalization. Uh, you mentioned Lenin, funny enough, you mentioned Lenin, but uh, I, I'm old school, <laughs> I grew up in Yugoslavia, and one of the things that we were taught was uh, that Lenin said that uh, law is the tool of the ruling class, so law is always created to serve the, the, the needs of, of the ruling class, so we should perhaps ask ourselves, who's the ruling class now? Is it capital, as you said, uh, the ruling class and the capital at one point the, it has no more interest to spread the, the good word, the good side of, of globalization, and that is uh, to increase the rights, uh, human rights, especially the rights of, of, of minorities, uh, ethnic national minorities, as it was, uh, and also uh, to keep uh, the responsibility of, of, uh, of those who commit crimes against them or uh, other crimes. So the, the capital might not be so interested anymore to, to have uh, uh, this positive side of globalization uh, uh, present in, in, in uh, all corners of the world, if you like. I, I think that uh, if you look at capital, and I think what Matthias said, that it's not always clear where does it come from and who is behind that and who is uh, who's moving it around. Uh, the capital uh, and, and the private sector, I think, uh, should also be there uh, included, uh, has a rather negative impact on globalization because they want to have as little rules as possible 
to be able to, to move around freely and to have a, a, as little uh, limitations and restrictions to their uh, business, if you like. Uh, this pandemic has revealed a lot of these, uh, of these sides of, of, of uh, capital's uh, interest because all of a sudden you cannot, I don't know, buy a car because the chip for that car is produced only in this one factory somewhere, I don't know where. Uh, the, 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 the material, uh, the, the masks that we were all looking for were only produced in China. And uh, the, the, the whole world suddenly realized that the capital has rearranged the power position that we were not aware of, uh, that the power position has changed. And now, uh, because of all this change, I think also the conflict comes up. And the conflict, I'm afraid, is becoming more and more powerful because uh, not just China uh, and the United States, but also Russia. Now we have, I think now we have a very dangerous situation that since the 1940s and 50s, we have the situation where the superpowers are looking at each other. And they are in a conflict situation. And I, my personal view is that uh, we haven't had such a dangerous situation uh, since a very long, uh, very long time. And I'm not so sure that the leaders of these countries are smart enough to, to stop at one point and to, to work for, uh, for our own interest uh, or the majority interest. I think if I go back to the environmental law and if, if you remember the Glasgow conference that just uh, ended uh, a few days ago or whenever, uh, the big polluters didn't even show there because what does that mean? They don't, they don't care about our planet, planet. so uh, China didn't uh, participate in this, uh, in the conference. Uh, so what does that say about their feeling of power? Do they really think that uh, by, uh, uh, obviously they must think that by gathering the capital that they also gathered uh, political power and also power to ignore the rules and the power to ignore everybody else on the planet. So. I am afraid that this will uh, not be over so uh, so soon and that we will mention Lenin a few more times. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vesna. Uh, uh, so uh, the Leninist view, uh, which, uh, which, I, I, which, which you say uh, is going to kind of uh, uh, be talked about, I mean, uh, it is very interesting that China or Mao or the Maoist revolution was based on uh, Leninist ideas. Mao called Lenin his elder brother and China called Russia the elder brother and it essentially is influenced by the Russian revolution. And now that China is at the top, uh, top of the chart in terms of sending its capital out, of course, it is, um, uh, it is, looking, for, uh, it is looking for ways to protect its own capital. So naturally, as, as, as Professor Matthias Kamm said, the picture is much more complicated than a simple straight line that used to be in the 19th century. You also, you say that perhaps this crisscross of capital is much more problematic because some of the countries are, are, are going to use the power of the capital to silence uh, some of the rights that, that have developed in the last 50 years. So therefore, uh, it brings us to the question, how is this going to shape individual disciplines of international law? Uh, so let me ask Professor Sadi about how do you think this crisscross of capital and not being a straight line anymore will impact international humanitarian law, a subject uh, that is yours, uh, Professor Sadi. You have to unmute, yes. Thank you for the Sorry. question. Uh, of course, this is an interesting question, uh, and it relates actually one of the uh, pre prepared questions is related to this dimension. What is new now as international lawyers? Of course, uh, there are many, many humanitarian uh, challenges going on to include, for example, growing number of asylum seekers and irregular, irregular migration issues. 
these is, is apparently simple challenges in fact has deeper deeper roots in in the recent history of world politics politics by the major powers of times to include our time because uh, what we have seen in the past is the in the international context indirect aggression to other targeted states this is an external factor but that does not represent the complete picture because equally responsibility rests with the national governments of those targeted states what we see in many parts of the world are corrupt governments resulting in growing social unrest social injustice supported by poor and unproductive national education systems weak social security all these contribute to the negative picture in the international community that we uh, witnessed in our day well every everyone likes uh, to be powerful uh, states like to be major powers in the in the regions or in the global context but that uh, the forgot, forgotten point is that power also incurs responsibility for example if you are claiming to be a global power that brings you also a global responsibility but when you look at the recent political history a lot of mistakes in this regard has been made by major, major economic powers. And this is coupled with ongoing pandemic in our day, which uh, makes the situation worse. The result, the result is uh, today's mass population movements from continents to other uh, countries, especially to the westwards uh, movements of peoples. Uh, for international lawyers, uh, this reminds some missing points in uh, analyzing these types of situations. The, I, I like to remind the audience about the importance of humanity. Humanity. We all talk about rule of law, respect for law, and the similar uh, terminology, but we many times, in many instances, forget about the humanitarian uh, dimension of the all these ongoing challenges uh, so that's that's not of course a one day event that that said the result of a long wrong practice of national governments not educating people in this uh, humanitarian dimensions of human life uh, that's that's the result of very much technology-oriented culture, uh, like expecting too many things from these uh, developments in the information technology area, artificial intelligence things and other things. But we are missing the human element in all these uh, activities. I think uh, many uh, problems uh, negatively affecting all human beings in the many parts of the world are not new things, but uh, the same scenario, a vicious circle in the history of mankind is seemingly continuing. And so long as we continue to repeat our past mistakes, uh, there's a famous saying in philosophy, the lesson or the class will continue until you learn your lesson. So we have to uh, have this culture of learning lessons from our own mistakes. Uh, there are uh, a lot of other things to say, but I like to stop here for the sake of saving time for other speakers. Thank you. So since you spoke about uh, learning from the past, perhaps globalization of international law or the new law of the global, is uh, a sustained study of the history, uh, the recent history and the history of the 19th century, not so much sociological, but perhaps historical, uh, to identify mistakes that we have made and that uh, mistakes we continue to make. Uh, Professor Adi, you also spoke about how corruption is an issue uh, with developing countries, in particular in Asia and Africa. But one of the things that, 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 that is rather staggering is that uh, since the Second World War, um, you know, uh, 
um, the, the American sort of the rise of America and fall of Europe after the Second World War um, also, cre also created a model where the Americans would want to have one window operations with many countries. And this one window operation uh, was more suitable if they had a dictator than an elected government. Uh, and now you're faced with uh, a, a country, uh, China, which is much more powerful than any of the countries that China has so far dealt with. Um, it, uh, it is not dictatorial, but authoritarian. Uh, so, 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 so now that the West collective, not just Europe, but Western collective has to engage with uh, the rest of the world um, uh, uh, in a different way, uh, because uh, uh, technology has allowed breaching sovereignty very easy. Uh, at, at, at any given point, uh, perhaps the best technology on that subject might be also with the developing country. So of course, the picture is much more complex than before. So, uh, so Professor um, uh, Matthias, come. How, how, how do you how do you see that this globalization uh, of international law, uh, if it is, if or whether we are in a post uh, globalization three phase where globalization will have a new meaning within international law, given that. Uh, uh, the, the 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 direction of capital flow uh, is is much more uh, circular than than uh, than a straight line. And, uh, first, um, I would emphasize uh, that um, there is an aspect. Um, a very central aspect, for at least from the perspective of the history of international law, uh, that has, um, since the 1990s, since the rise of the last wave of globalization, actually taken a back seat and arguably been subject to regression uh, all the time, continuously, not just in the last years, but even before that. And that's the whole um, uh, law of, uh, international law of, well, what was originally after 1944, at least by those who established the system by Roosevelt, thought of as a system of collective security. And all of that, those ideas, ideas that international law provides a multilateral framework of collective security, that's what the UN Charter was supposed to be about. Of course, that was quickly given up in the Cold War, but it was, this is the point, never revitalized after 1990. Um, uh, and there, there's a story uh, we can tell of basically continuous decline um, with regard to ambition um, uh, and uh, efforts. And so the, today the law relating to the use of force uh, is basically a continuous, their doctrinal debates, the core structure and point of which is to create an ever more enabling framework for the use of force, um, where there's still some kind of ultimate legal limits uh, to the way that force is permitted to be used, but in a way that creates more and more possibilities for powerful actors uh, to use force. So there's a continuous, but that's a continuous story. So this is not that what's happened in the, since the rise of China or uh, in the last 10 years, uh, there's a continuous story uh, to be told there about the abandoning of collective security as an idea connected to what international law should achieve. Today we have alliances, balance of power considerations, we basically have the old war of uh, the the old world of um, of pre World War One uh, in that regard, and it, and Kissinger uh, I think rightly um, suggested that if we are looking at historical precedents for the type of um, situation we are in from the perspective of security concerns uh, and power struggles, then the the closest analogy uh, is. Uh, the early 20th century uh, with the rise, there it was the rise of Germany um, uh, going up against an old established empire, the, the Britain um, and the tensions that arise there. And today it's the rise of China um, uh, in, in, in a relationship, in a tension with the old established structures of, uh, of a different type of empire uh, established by uh, under the leadership, at least, of the United States. So that's kind of, that's, 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 and there's always, there's something when you focus just on the use of force, the collective security ideas, and the law developing in that area, um, there's a, 
you know, there's there's a counter story to tell uh, to the globalization story that we tell when we focus on economic globalization or human rights um, uh, globalization. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Now, with the rise of China, and if you ask, well, how which direction is the, is the new going to be? I think a lot will depend on whether and how China can be made and wants to think of itself as a major stakeholder um, uh, in the international system as it currently exists. In certain areas, it will have an interest to be that. It will want to play an active constructive role. And in other areas, it will deem that things, that it will not be in its interest uh, to further support and play a constructive role within these existing structures and instead try to create alternative fora um, and move away and undermine and subvert um, uh, existing structures. So it will be an interesting and open question, in my view, across a wide range of areas um, in which way this uh, might go. So I think there is something intellectually lazy about thinking of the rise of China as simply a new version of a Cold War, potentially between the West, or at least the world of liberal democracies in some wider sense, versus you know, China and its allies. China is not a revolutionary uh, power, uh, whereas the Soviet Union at least arguably was, that was also contested at the time, uh, whether how much it actually was a genuine revolutionary power and how much it was a status quo oriented um, uh, geostrategic actor. Um, uh, but uh, today there's no doubt that China is not a, a revolutionary actor, uh, but uh, merely a, a powerful uh, a state that happens in its own internal structure and given its own experience, uh, be distanced towards um, the dominant ideas connected to liberal democracy uh, that is somehow hardwired into and somehow connected uh, to the dominant structures of international law. So that creates tension and that, that creates potential for different types of evolutions um, that that uh, are imaginable, but whether the evolution will be one that in, historically we will then describe as deglobalization or just a different orientation given to globalization or a differentiation between different domains, that I think remains to be seen. That is an open question. So it's interesting that you should uh, kind of, uh, uh, with reference to uh, Henry Kissinger, say that perhaps China is in the same situation as Germany before the First World War. In fact, if I look at new scholarship uh, that studies China, um, uh, uh, in fact, there are scholars who are actually using Carl Schmitt actually um, to kind of uh, you know, talk about China. Or in fact, there is scholarship about the reception of Carl Schmitt in China. Um, uh, uh, and all of this is happening either in international law or we can say, well, it, not so much IR, but international and history of international law kind of uh, frame. So it's it, so perhaps in that sense, the observation um, is 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 is, uh, is is quite uh, on the point. Uh, why are we using Carl Smith, uh, uh, you know, in China uh, uh, to kind of then? I'm not saying that this is used to justify China's uh, position uh, uh, on any of these international law matters, just to study China. As you said, China is not revolutionary. It is a powerful, it's a powerful state doing things that powerful states do, but not always revolutionary. But if you look at our uh, region, that is South Asia, and uh, the, the recent withdrawal of the US from uh, Afghanistan, the first country that the, the, the Taliban regime uh, uh, looked at uh, was China and negotiations happened in Beijing. Uh, of course, uh, uh, that, that is also, that for Beijing is a big signaling of how um, you know, countries in the region in Asia in particular are now using China as the way to negotiate and understand and perhaps China as, the, as their uh, spokesperson to present their point of view. So of course, uh, some reversal of the old order is, is visible here. So my, so my question to Professor Parrish is, this reversal, uh, how, how much of this reversal is, 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 uh, is a deja vu uh, as, uh, and, and what part of this is new? Is it just, a deja, it has happened, it is, it is it's a circle, it's a circle, completing of a circle uh, with some newness or it's just, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's just the same structure with a new name, China in it. 
Yeah, I, I guess I tend not to see the reversal as more as an evolution. And perhaps this is where Matthias ended with that it's, um, and so I think we've seen some sort of re retrenchment from globalization as a result of COVID, disruption of supply chains, uh, things like Brexit or whatnot. But I think overall, you're not changing the general idea that we're seeing contestation and competition on, on, a, on, a, on a global world scale. Um, for me, I, I think one of the things that's important to keep separate is the development of law and the evolution of law versus the changes of what's happening on the ground in the political sphere and the, the economic sphere and the social sphere. If we believe that international law is traditionally conceived is, is valuable, that it, it serves a purpose that, that, that helps with human rights or environmental rights or with financial regulation, whatever area it is, it's not something that will happen just inevitably. And so one of the questions for different countries, whether it's the United States or Europe or India and others as it relates to China, is how much are we going to engage with China to try to move them into the existing system and have them as a part of that system with them also contesting and changing and molding it? And how much are they going to give on up on that because there isn't some sort of engagement? And I, you know, from, from my perspective and my research, I think one of the, the big mistakes strategically by the United States has been uh, both on the political left and the political right has been the withdrawal from traditional international legal mechanisms. Matthias's description of the uh, you know, abandonment of a concept around the use of force is also consistent with what's happened in a whole bunch of other areas. Um, one way of looking at, for example, what's happened in environmental human rights is to say that that's an advancement of international law. But another way of looking at it is actually say the traditional treaty-based international human rights law has been undermined at least in part by countries going at it on its own with competing mechanisms that may be necessary for enforcement and other uh, reasons, but seem to be uh, competing with traditional approaches to how you might advance international law. And so um, I think uh, Saadi had said, you know, with great increased you know, uh, power comes increased responsibility. And uh, that would be nice. I, I'm not sure that's true in, in practice. I think we need to think strategically about how we do these hard fought battles of how we move international law along. And if we think that international law traditionally conceived, treaty based, consent based, customary law is important and does good things and perhaps constrains some of the excesses of globalization in the way that uh, Vesna was describing some of the negatives, then I think it's something that has to be thought strategically of how we bring the large powers of the world together in order to, uh, and, and not just the states themselves, but the, the underlying civil society to believe again that this is a path towards um, using law to, to do good or to reach whatever the, the positive advancement are. And if we don't think of it that way, th then I do think it sort of unravels. And, and whether that's because capital sort of uh, short-term interest in capital overturns other interests, uh, whether they're environmental human rights or whatnot, or, or whether that's just that uh, you know, a, a state like China feels that they've been kept out of an international system. And at one point their willingness to engage becomes uh, changes to one where it becomes uh, uh, more suitable for them to create competing systems of, of international law where they have a greater role in, in controlling and molding that, I think then becomes a, a strong reality. Not sure I'm being articulate on that, but I, I, guess, I guess what I'm trying to emphasize is that I think we need to spend more time thinking not just about the history and the sociology of it, but the strategy of how you build and rebuild international law in a way that serves our end goals, whatever those goals may be. And if it's, if it's human rights and environmental rights, then how do we think strategically about how we advance those interests so that capital um, becomes aligned with advancing those interests at the same time they're advancing their capital interests. And if we believe that China is going to become more powerful, how do we engage them in the system rather than uh, you know, abandoning them in a way that they feel compelled with their new power to create an own competing system that ultimately may be uh, less attractive to us for a variety of different reasons, uh, maybe because of their authoritarian approach, uh, or maybe because their values are a little different than values in other parts of the world. No, I, 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 I get you, Professor Parrish, on that point. Uh, in fact, you refer to the, I, the treaties many times, a classic subject for us international lawyers. What are we without studying treaties? Uh, in treaties, we freeze our commitments and, and, and at a later time we study them and sort of see whether the commitments we have made in treaties are, 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 are uh, being followed up or not. So, so I think uh, that way is, um, treaties become an important system. And therefore, again, we come and on, the, on the subject of treaties, uh, we come back to China again, since the 1920s, soon after the Russian revolution, again, Lenin is here, uh, we had 
uh, China talking about um, uh, an idea of unequal treaties and how to use ribus six tantibus as against pacta sum survanda. Uh, you know, she said, well, the world always talked about talks about pacta sum survanda in relation to treaties, but what about change in fundamental circumstances and you know that leading to sort of re thinking of the treaties. So rethinking of treaties again uh, ha, is now uh, has at least a, a century of his a century's history, 1920s, we are in 2020s, uh, a century of thinking on, on how to rethink treaties. And my own observation is that, that in a very interesting way, now in countries like India, which received their system from England, therefore our laws is more British than people realize actually, and our position is more Western then people realize just because India as an old civilization has the image. But as you said, Professor Parrish, you're interested in law part. And as like you, I'm also as a lawyer interested in not just the civilizational part, but also the law part. And on the law part, you realize that our position is more Western than people realize. And that lies at the uh, uh, core of the conflict with China, because when you talk to China, China expects us to speak a different vocabulary, whereas we speak the classic Western vocabulary of treaty, international law sources, let's talk about treaties, not so much power, but treaties. And this actually is uh, the point where we actually need that stalemate uh, with, with China. So again, um, uh, 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 so, so, so I hear you on the uh, issues of multilateralism using treaties, but I would like to, uh, since we're drawing close uh, to our, our, our uh, the, con the conversation is, uh, is about to end. My own observation is how in a very interesting way, uh, uh, Chinese scholars are uh, 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 using international law doctrine, engaging with international law doctrines much more seriously. And that is what my observation is of the last 10 years. And they are, they are actually making arguments against treaties based on customary international law by saying, however much a treaty freezes the discourse on a subject, it always leaves customs some customs from which we can build, build. So there's always this residual customs. And when I studied it closely, I realized that actually there is a tradition of making the argument of unequal treaties on which you should use the book six tantibus with the presence of customs that will always, that can actually, uh, 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 that, can, uh, that can actually subvert a treaty. Why? Because if you look at the sources of international law, treaties and customs are equal sources. Just that treaties are much more visible in black and white, but in the ICJ statute article 38, uh, one that talks about sources of international law, treaties and, uh, treaties and customary laws are actually equal sources. And China's new argumentation is that since they are equal sources, we will tell you how there are customs existent that actually are in contravention to the treaties we signed and we'll use it, perhaps, uh, use power to uh, sort of project uh, their positions through customs. So it's not just make it power, so to speak, but actually it is getting much more uh, on the lines you spoke, Professor Parrish, about using the law, lawfare, as the word is used these days, lawfare to uh, actually, uh, or, or lawfare as a fig leaf for power. I mean, you know, that will also be the case. Yeah. Srijit, are we... I see you here, so I suppose you're here to conclude it. Mr. Singh, could I just quickly respond to that a little bit? Um, sure, Professor, yeah. You know, one thing I think is interesting is we haven't talked about this too much, but you can see how this maps onto the globalization of legal education, right? The, the fact that you're describing that Chinese lawyers are using the language of traditional treaties and customary law is in part the massive globalization we've seen around higher education and legal education over the last couple of decades. It's not surprising that many Chinese lawyers have studied uh, in Europe and in Germany, in the UK, in the United States, and a number of other places. And what they're now doing is they're using the language that was uh, of that training, just like many others, um, as a way to sort of then mold the law in a way that serves, uh, serves their interests, but both as a state, but also uh, as an individual. The, the question I think ultimately is, um, you know, I maybe because I'm, I'm in the West, I like Western norms in the sense that I like Western, I like human rights uh, broadly, I like environmental rights broadly, and regardless of whether that's Western and whether there's problems with it, right, that there may be changes, I actually think that's worth fighting for, right, and so the question then strategically is how do you lock that in for as long as possible? Um, I do think what you've described actually gives some hope, the globalization there, at least on legal education, means that we have 
um, although it's got the negative side, right? It's uh, Western imperialism in some ways, and it's in one form. It also creates a common language where you're debating on a doctrinal level how to emerge forward. And so I, I should clarify, it's not that I'm saying that, you know, treaties, is, but the old sort of collaborative multilateral approach has been abandoned to some extent by the United States. Uh, Matthias, I think, gave a really great example in the use of force, but also in a whole bunch of other hosts of areas. And I do think Western nations run a risk that by themselves sort of giving up on traditional international norms, particularly as it relates to human rights and, and environmental rights, that they run the risk that the rest of the world will give up on it too. But your story, I think, is one more of hope that we're actually seeing a common rhetoric that may be tied to globalization itself, in this case, globalization of legal education. In, Things indeed, like this that Jindal does. <laughs> sure, sure. In, indeed, indeed. And, and uh, in that sense, uh, international has succeeded uh, despite its critique. It has succeeded in at least allowing a variety of states with variety of civilization and his history uh, and uh, culture and nature of government to actually still speak a language in which we can all talk. I mean, we all like our languages. Uh, we have our mother languages, mother tongue, uh, but we also need to have a common language in, in which we speak. And that, that, that is why uh, all of us uh, on the panel today our votaries of international law, despite we, we are critical of, of uh, some of its uh, issues, uh, historical in particular, but I think the faith in international law, again, at the time uh, uh, of uncertainty, I think faith in law only grows, and international law is no exception to that, I suppose. Uh, the faith in law will only grow because uh, rights come from law, and who does not need rights? We all need rights. And so, yeah, I, I, I in agreement with you, Professor Parish, on that point. Yes. Uh, so, Srijit, I, uh, I think we have come to the close of our panel. Uh, I would uh, thank all of you for this wonderful talk, and I hope this is not just the, the start and end of a conversation, but at some uh, point, uh, somewhere um, in some space, we are able to uh, converse and take our conversation forward. And I look forward to, uh, to having more conversations uh, with all of you. Thank you very much for your time and uh, your ideas. Thank you. Mm -hmm.